Okay, thank you for the presentation. Okay, so this morning, Professor von Mühlendahl already gave you an overview of the most recent case law on trademark law. And I will now present some recent and important uh, preliminary rulings on copyrights and related rights. No. Can you help me with that? Yeah, okay. Okay, so this is the structure of my presentation. First, I will say um, some words about the backgrounds of copyright harmonization and also about the role of the Court of Justice in EU copyright law. And then I will present some summaries of five selected preliminary rulings that cover four areas. So the first area is the notion of work, which works are protected under EU copyright law, uh, the scope of exclu the exclusive right to distribution, then the scope of the exclusive right of communication to the public, and last, limitations and exceptions. And uh, at the end, I will also give you a brief outlook on some pending cases, and also tell you a little bit more about the observatory's work in, in the field of infringement case law, IPR infringement case law. So first, some words about the background of harmonization of copyrights in the EU. So as to the general framework, we currently still have 28 national copyright laws, but they have been harmonized to a large extent by a number of EU directives, and most recently also by two regulations. The EU member states also have to comply with some international treaties, so most importantly the Berne Convention and the Copyright Treaties, which set a number of minimum rules that have to be respected. So within this general framework, uh, there are some, I would say, main horizontal directives which have harmonized some major aspects of copyright law and which have also been the subject of many preliminary rulings. So on the substance, the most important instrument has probably been the um, Information Society Directive or Copy Copyright Directive from 2001, which has harmonized a number of um, exclusive rights, economic rights, and has provided a list of limitations to copyrights and also contains some provision on technical protection measures and injunctions against intermediaries. On enforcement, there's the 2004 Enforcement Directive and also the e-commerce directive, which uh, is mainly important in copyright um, when it comes to the liability and obligations of online intermediaries for third-party infringements. Most recently, the institutions have adopted the Copyright and the Digital Single Market Directive, which has introduced a, will introduce a number of new provisions, but I'm not going to address this new instrument today. So what has been the role of the Court of Justice in EU copyright? So over the past 20 years, there have been around 70 key preliminary rulings, and the Court has provided guidance on a number of open concepts and also guided the member states on how to apply copyright to the digital age, uh, which has brought about new types of uses and new legal issues that weren't necessarily envisaged at the time when the directive was adopted. So examples for such um, notions or concepts are the notion of work, and I will present two decisions on that uh, today. Also, the um, right, the, the notion of communication to the public and how it is applied, for example, to linking or also to platforms, so whether certain platforms can be considered to make a communication to the public and under what conditions. And in the field of limitations and exceptions, the court has clarified, uh, for example, the notion of parody, fair compensation, and also provided some clarity on the question of the legality of the source copy in the context of private copying. And some cases have uh, provided some clarity on the scope or criteria uh, of liabil liability of online intermediaries. So especially in academic circles, the um, decisions on preliminary rulings on copyright are very much debated. And it has been suggested that the Court of Justice actually advances EU copyright more than, uh, more actively than the lawmaking institutions. And uh, some, so Professor Bentley, for example, has called this harmonization by stealth. So what about the most recent um, copyright case law? 
Well, for today, I've, I will, I've covered some cases from 2018 and 2019, and I've selected five judgments from uh, four areas. And for each of the cases, I will briefly present the background, so the disputes in the national proceedings, the main legal issues and questions referred to the court, and the main lines of reasoning um, of the court and the criteria applied, because I think this is what's most important for you if you come across any of these questions. So the first area uh, will be works protected by copyrights. And here we present the case Lebola, which concerned the taste of a food product, and the case Kofemel, uh, which concerned works of applied arts or designs. Uh, then second, um, the second area is scope of the right of distribution. So here we'll present the case Imran Sayed, which concerned the storage of infringing articles. Then the third area is the right of communication to the public. And here we'll present the so-called Cordoba case, which concerned the reposting of works. So whether reposting of works on the internet can, is the communication to the public. And last on limitations and exceptions, I will present the Pelham case, which um, well, concerned the, the question of so-called sampling, but also um, fundamental rights and freedoms and more generally harmonization of exceptions and, and uh, exclusive rights. So the first area I cover is works protected by copyrights. And the first decision here is the Levula case from November 2018, which concerned the question of whether the taste of a food product can be protected by copyright. So as to the backgrounds, Levula is a Dutch company which produces a, a dip with cream cheese and herbs. And Levula argued that one of its competitors, Smilde, which produced a similar dip, had infringed its copyright in the taste of the dip. So Levola argued that the taste could be protected as a work of literature, science, or arts. And amongst other, they rely on a Dutch decision from 2006 where the Dutch Supreme Court had recognized that uh, the scent of a perfume could be protected by copyright. So what were the legal issues and questions referred to the court? Well, the Regional Court of Appeal Arnhem Leeuwarden from the Netherlands asked uh, the Court of Justice to clarify whether the taste of, the, of a food product can be protected under the, under the copyright directive. And if it can be protected, then what would be the conditions? And would copyright con protection only cover the taste as such or also the recipe? And they also ask uh, what evidence the parties could possibly provide to prove the originality of a taste, and also how a national court could assess whether the taste, the copyright in a taste has been infringed. This is what the court answered. So first, it um, re stated that, uh, in principle, the taste of a food product could be protected by copyrights if it can qualify as a work. And it uh, reiterated uh, some previous case law that uh, for subject matter to qualify as a work, it has to fulfill two cumulative conditions. So first, the subject matter has to be original, meaning in line with previous case law, that it has to be the author's own intellectual creation. And second, that it has to be the expression of this creation. And here, this, is also, this principle also refers to, one, to a general principle of copyright law that uh, copyright always protects the expression and not the underlying ideas or concepts. The court also refers to Article 2.1 of the Berne Convention, which states that every production in the literary, scientific, and artistic domain, um, whatever its mode or the form of its expression, may be protected by copyright. Um, however, the court explains that a work in, within the meaning of the copyright directive has to be expressed in a way which makes it possible for users to identify it with sufficient precision and objectivity, even though that expression does not necessarily have to be permanent. The, reasons for this, the reason for this requirement is that authorities, individuals or competitors must be able to identify clearly and precisely the subject matter of the exclusive rights. And there should be no element of subjectivity. So it must be clear what exactly is it's covered by the co copyright protection. And in applying this 
criterion. The court concluded that the taste of a food that the taste of a food product cannot be identified with sufficient and precision and objectivity because it will mainly be identified based on <coughs> taste sensations and experiences and these are subjective and variable because they will depend on various factors particular to the person who tastes the food product and such factors can be age, food preferences or consumption habits or also the environment or context in which you taste the food product. And the court also adds that in the current state of scientific development, it would not be technically possible to identify the taste of a food product so precisely and objectively as to distinguish it from, a, from the taste of a similar product. Yeah, so conclusion under EU law, currently the taste of a food product cannot be protected by copyright. So in another very recent case, the court clarified the criteria for copyright protection for works of designs or works of applied arts. And this was the case Koffemel from the 12th of September, so around two weeks ago. What was the background? So um, G-Star and Koffemel are both companies in the fashion industry. And G-Star claimed that jeans, sweatshirts and t-shirts that were designed, produced and marketed by Koffemel were copies of its own designs. So the, so the parties argue about whether these designs are also works protected by copyright. So what were the main legal issues? So the Court of Justice had to consider a number of provisions relating to copyright and design protection, notably Article 17 of the Designs Directive, which lays down the principle of accumulation of protection. So it states that a design protected in the EU shall also be eligible um, under, for copyright protection under the national law. However, it states that the um, extent and the conditions of protection, including the level of originality required, should be determined by the member states. And this wording is also reiterated in the Designs Directive, Article 96.2 of the Design Regulation, sorry, and Design Regulation, and it also reflects the wording of um, the Berne Convention. So, and the national law relevant um, in this case, Article 2.1 of the Portuguese Copyright Code, specifically states that works of applied arts, industrial designs, or works of design, which are artistic creations, can be protected by copyright, independently of their protection by industrial property rights. And the Portuguese court pointed out, out that um, neither in case law nor in doctrine there was any consensus on the degree of originality required. So the Portuguese Supreme Court asked the Court of Justice to clarify whether the criteria of protection developed by the Court of Justice in previous case law, so the criterion of the author's own intellectual creation, also applies to works of applied arts. And more specifically, it asks whether national law can require that a work of applied arts, in addition to its utilitarian purpose, should create its own visual and distinctive effect from an aesthetic point of view. So they are asking whether such a requirement for protection is compatible with EU law and um, more specifically with Article 2A um, of the Copyright Directive on the Reproduction Right. So these are the court's answers. First, the court reiterated some general criteria for qualification of a work. So work is an autonomous concept of EU law and it has to be interpreted and applied in a uniform manner. It also um, reiterates that subject matter, which is dictated by technical considerations, rules or constraints that leave no room for creative freedom, would not be original enough, enough to be considered as a work. And it also reiterates the criteria developed in the Levola case, namely subject matter has to be expressed in a manner which makes it identifiable with sufficient precision and objectivity. And then the court looks at the legal framework on copyright and designs, including the principle of accumulation of protection. So according to the court, EU law provides for both design law protection and copyright protection in different legal instruments. And these two types of protection do not exclude each other. 
So the Copyright Directive, the Information Society Directive, does not affect legislation on design law, including the principle of accumulation of protection. However, under the Copyright Directive, so under the Information Society Directives, designs can be works when the two conditions for protection which the court has developed in its case law are fulfilled. So it has to be um, an original, uh, original creation and the expression of this creation. So what about other criteria for work of applied arts? Can the aesthetic originality of a work of applied arts be decisive? Here the court um, explains or goes back to the objectives of protection and explains that design law and copyright have pursued different objectives. So design law should protect new but utilitarian objects aimed for mass production and the protection should be limited in time to recoup investment without hampering competition at least excessively. While on the other, ha on the other hand, copyright um, provides the significantly stronger protection because it's, it lasts longer and the exclusive rights are very broad. So that protection should be limited to works. So for the court, the accumulation of protection, even if the principle is accepted, it's limited to certain situation. And the court takes the view that the aesthetic effect of a design depends on subjective perceptions of beauty, and these are felt by the individual that looks at the design. So the aesthetic effect cannot identify the subject matter with sufficient precision and objectivity. And so the aesthetic effect would not allow deciding whether the design is an intellectual creation, which, cre which reflects the author's free creative choices. So the only criterion for protection for, des for designs or works of applied arts is the criterion of um, the author's own intellectual creation. So the second area where the Court of Justice has recently provided some guidance is the right of distribution. And here I will present the case Imran Syed from December of last year, which concerned the question whether the storage of infringent articles could also be an infringement of the right to distribution. So as to the background, Mr. Syed, a Swedish resident, ran a retail shop in Stockholm where he sold clothes and accessories with infringing rock music mo motifs. And he also stored items in two storage facilities. So one was located right next to his shop and the other one a bit further away in a suburb of Stockholm. And he regularly restocked his shop with um, articles from those facilities. So in criminal proceedings for copyright and trademark infringement, the prosecutor held that the goods, both the goods in the shop and in the storage facilities, were being offered for sale or distributed to the public. Uh, so the legal issues and questions refer to the courts. Here the um, Swedish Supreme Court asked the Court of Justice to clarify whether the author's exclusive right to distribution under Article 1 of the Copyright Directive can be infringed by storing goods with infringing motives when goods that are identical or with identical motives are being offered for sale. And it also asks whether it is relevant that the storage facility are right next to the shop or whether they are located further away. So just as a reminder for you, uh, Article 4.1 of the Copy Directive on the Distribution Right states that member states shall provide for authors in respect of the original of their works or copies thereof, the exclusive right to authorize or prohibit any form of distribution to the public by sale or otherwise. So what did the Court of Justice answer? First, it reiterated, reiterated some principles that it had developed in another case on the right of distribution, the case Dimensione Direct Sales. And it states that Article 4.1 of the directive has to be interpreted in accordance with Article 6.1 of the WIPO Copyright Treaty. So distribution of the public by sale should have the same meaning as making available to the public through sale. And distribution to the public covers a series of acts that would go at least from the conclusion of a sales contract to the performance of this contract 
by delivery to a member of the public. And these series of acts can also include acts or steps that precede the conclusion of a sales contract, even if they're not necessarily followed by a transfer of ownership. However, however it must be proven that the goods are actually intended for sale or to be distributed to the public. For example, if they're being offered for sale in a member state where the works would be protected by copyright. So the storage of infringing goods, which are identical to the ones that are sold in the shop, could be an indication that the goods are actually intended to be sold. However, this, is not, this fact alone is not enough to prove that there was an infringing act prior to sale, because in principle, the goods in the warehouse could also have been intended for different purposes. Yeah, so the national court has to determine in the light of all of the evidence available to it, whether all of the stored goods identical to those shots sold in the shop or only some of them were, were intended to be marketed, were intended to be sold. So the national court has to take into account all relevant factors and these factors can include the distance between the facility, between the shop and uh, between the shop and the um, storage facilities, but this criterion cannot alone be decisive. It can also take into account uh, accounting elements, whether the shop is regularly restocked with goods from the storage facilities, the volumes of sales and ordered orders as compared to the volumes of stored goods or, or current sales contracts. Yeah, so under certain conditions, the storage of infringing goods can also be um, copyright infringement. So the next decision I will present concerns the right of communication to the public. This is the so-called Cordoba case from August of last year, and it concerned the question whether the reposting of a photo um, online can be copyright infringement. So as to the background, I split up the um, facts here into a few bullet points to make the sequence of events a bit clearer. So a photographer had taken a nice photograph that um, showed a motive from the city of Cordoba. And he gave the, the operators of an online travel portal authorization to publish this photograph on their website. Then a pupil in Germany downloaded the photo and he used it because it was freely accessible on the web with no restrictions. And he used this photo in a school presentation. And this school presentation this displaying the photograph was later made available on the website of the school. So the photographer claimed that the use by the school on the school's website infringed his rights. So what were the main legal issues and questions referred to the courts? In this case, the German Federal Court of Justice asked the Court of Justice of the EU to justify whether the reposting of a photograph which is freely and lawfully accessible on the web, on another website, is an act of communication to the public in the sense of the copyright directive. And here again, as a reminder, the right of communication to the public is laid on Article 3.1 of the Information Society Directive, and it states that member states should provide authors with the exclusive right to authorize or prohibit any communication to the public of their work by wireless or wireless means in such a way that members of the public may access them from a place and at a time individually chosen by them. So this right to communication to the public was initially introduced by the WIPO copyright treaties in the 1990s to strengthen the position of right holders um, against online infringers. So it was supposed to help them enforce their rights online. So what did the Court of Justice answer? Um, as a preliminary remark, the court first re it reiterated that photographs can enjoy copyright protection when they are intellectual creation, which reflect their author's personality and express his or her free creative choices. So the typical um, criterion for protection also applies to photographs. Then on the communication to the public, um, here also the court reiterates previous case law, which had 
laid down two cumulative criteria for there to be a communication to the public. So first there has to be an act of communication of a work and this communication has to be done to, to a public. So what does this mean for reposting? Well, according to the court, reposting of a photograph which had previously been posted on another website after copying it onto a private server must be considered as making available and therefore as an act of communication. And why is because it gives end, this act gives end users the opportunity to access the photograph on another website, on the new website. So the photo is communicated to a new public because the rights holder, when it's allowed the initial, the initial website operators to upload it to the initial website, only took into account internet users which would, who would visit that website. And the court also says that the fact that the rights holder did not restrict access to the work on the first site is not relevant because the enjoyment and exercise of copyrights uh, may not be subject to any formality. So um, imposing an obligation to always apply restrictive measures could possibly be considered as a type of formality. And the court also stresses that uh, reaching a different conclusion, so not admitting that reposting would be a communication to the public or would be covered by the exclusive right, would amount to applying the exhaustion rule to the right of communication to the public, and this is specifically excluded by Article 3.3 of the Copyright Directive. So the online rights, in principle, are not exhausted. And it would also, not admitting that it's a communication to the public, would also deprive the right holder of the opportunity to claim an appropriate reward for the use. So to license other users and receive an economic uh, reward for that. The Court of Justice also stresses that uh, reposting is different from hyperlinking, because hyperlinking can, under certain conditions, be um, allowed, according to the Court's case law. And hyperlinks, according to the Court, contribute to the sound operation of the Internet and to the dissemination of information. And this is not true to the same extent for reposting. And hyperlinking to a work which is lawfully available on the web would respect the preventive nature of copyrights because the author could remove its wor his work from the initial website at any time and thus probably any hyperlink directing to it would be made obsolete. And reposting, on the other hand, would entail that the work would remain available on the second website even if the author decides to remove it from the, from the initial website. So it would not allow the author to control or subsequent uses of his work. And the court also, also mentioned that in this case the user played a decisive role in the act of communication. Yeah, so conclusion, reposting can be a communication uh, to the public. And uh, the last case that I will present um, is the Pelham case. It relates, amongst others, to um, limitations and exceptions to fundamental rights and also to the lawfulness of so-called sampling. Yeah, so, and this is a decision from July of this year. So, as to the background, so Mr. Pelham and others um, were the producers of a song with a German title, No Mir. And, the, and in this song, they used a sample, so an approximately two seconds of a rhythm sequence from a sound recording from another group. So a sound recording belonged to, was owned by um, the, a, a German group called Kraftwerk. And two members of this German group claimed that the use of the sample infringed their copyrights and related rights. So what were the main legal issues and questions um, of the National Court here? So the German Federal Court of Justice again asked the Court of Justice of the EU to clarify whether the use of a sample, so of a very short sequence of a photogram in another photogram, can infringe um, either or the reproduction, the reproduction and or the distribution rights of this, the other phonogram producer. And in case the sample would be covered by the exclusive rights, the court asked whether sampling or using a sample could 
be allowed, for example, as a quotation, so under the quotation exception, or under any other exception that might exist in national law, or by taking into account the rights of the rights and freedoms set out in the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights. So actually, what was also at stake here was an exception in uh, the German copyright law, the so-called free use exception. And according that, to that provision, an independent work created in the free use of the work of another person may be published or exploited without the consent of the, the author of the previous work. So the Court, Court of Justice had to decide whether this German free use exception is compatible with EU law. So what did the Court of Justice say? Well, first on sampling and the reproduction right, the court found that sampling amounts to a reproduction in part in the sense of Article 2C, so in, sense of, in the sense of EU law. However, a user who uses the technique of sampling to create a new work also exercises, exercises the freedom of the arts. So if he uses a sample in a form that is so modified that it would be unrecognizable to the ears, so that uh, users would not recognize it, would not infringe the phonograms producer's exclusive rights. And why? Because in such a case, sampling would not interfere with the producer's opportunity of realizing satisf satisfactory returns on his or her investment, so it would not interfere with their economic interests. Then, on the other hand, on sampling and the distribution rights, the court found that a sample is not a copy in the sense of the rental rights directive. This directive also aims at um, giving rights holders tools to fight against damages caused by piracy, so to tools against um, the circulation of pirated copies. So the court here also refers to the wording of the Geneva's, Geneva Phonograms Convention, which uses the term duplicates, and duplicates would embody all or substantial parts of the sounds fixed in another phonogram. So a copy in the sense of the Rental Rights Directive would reproduce all or substantial parts of the sounds fixed in a phonogram. So in this case, there was no infringement of the Rental Rights Directive. Okay, and as to the German free use exception, the court held that member state cannot provide for any other exceptions to the rights of phonogram producers other than those listed in Article 5 of the copy direct, copyright directives. So Article 5 um, provides a long list of exceptions and limitations. Um, most of these exceptions and limitations are optional to implement by member states, but at the same time the list is exhaustive. So member states, and here the court confirms that member states cannot, cannot um, implement any other exceptions as those listed. So what about sampling as a quotation? Well, here the court first clarifies that the quotation exception may apply to the use of a protected musical work, so it's not limited to literary works, it may apply to a musical work, but all of the conditions of the quotation exception have to be fulfilled. And there are actually a number of um, conditions for the quotation exception. So first, the quotation has to be made for a purpose. That purpose can be, for example, criticism or review. The quoted work has to have been lawfully published. The person, the user, so the person qu quoting, should as far as possible cite the source, including the author's name. The use has to be in, in accordance with fair practice, and the extent of the use has to be required by the specific purpose of the, of the quotation. And in addition to that, uh, the court develops here in the Pelham case that the creator of a new work must want to enter into a dialogue with the existing work. And in principle, this could be possible with a sound sample. However, such a dialogue is not possible when the earlier work cannot be identified in the quotation. And uh, it seems that this would have been the case in the sample at stake here in the, in the national proceedings. And last, the court also confirms that um, the Information Society Directive has fully harmonized the reproduction rights for phonogram producers. 
And this is so because these rights have been defined in unequivocal terms. They're not qualified by any conditions or subject to any particular measure. So member states have no leeway in implementing them. So in the Pelham case, the court overall has provided guidance on, on a number of important issues, uh, mainly on the harmonization of limitations and exceptions and also of exclusive rights. So this is just um, to briefly mention that on the same date, on 29th of July, the court also issued two other preliminary rulings on limitations and exceptions and fundamental rights. And actually, all of these three cases were referred by the German um, Supreme, uh, Federal Court of Justice. So one is the case Spiegel Online, and the other one is the case Funke Medien. So in case you're interested, there's some useful clarification in these in this preliminary rulings on the exceptions for quotation and news reporting, and also of the role of freedom of information and the press. So... At the moment, there are also a number of interesting preliminary rulings pending. So just to mention a few examples, so the YouTube and the Elsevier case both relate to the scope and criteria for liability of online intermediaries. So to the question whether different types of online platforms can make a communication to the public. And the case Tom Cabinet relates to the resale of e-books and the online, the question of online exhaustion of copyrights. So basically it raises the question whether a business model for second-hand e-books could be compliant with EU copyright law. There are also, there are more IP relevant um, <coughs> and copyright relevant preliminary rulings pending. So for the time being, you could uh, take a look at the, at the list published by, on the website of the UK IP office which is a quite uh, good overview, if you're interested. So, and this is just for you to know, if you're looking for more case law on infringement and enforcement of IP rights, including copyrights, uh, the EUIPO has a um, database, the eSearch case law database, which, con which includes preliminary rulings, key preliminary rulings of the Court of Justice, but also of national courts. It's actually a project we are running with um, national IP offices and Lat the Latvian IP office also participates in that. We also have a new case law. This is a document where we regularly publish, um, so once a month we publish an overview of recent cases, recent important cases, preliminary rulings and also national cases. So I actually also encourage you if you come across an interesting IP infringement case to, to inform us because we would like to be we'd like to know about it and maybe we can publish a summary. We also recently published, actually just this month published published um, our IPR enforcement case law collection, which is a case book, and this year it was on the liability and obligations of intermediaries. So we've included uh, case law from 14 member states and also from the Court of Justice. Yes, and there's always also the EYPO's Academy's learning portal, with, which provides um, courses on all kind of, kind of IPR-related topics, and of course also on our trademark and designs practice. I know you are interested in that. So I would encourage you, if you to have a look and um, just create an account. And very soon, actually, in the end of October, there will be a webinar on intermediary liability, which also focuses on case law. So you might want to, it's at 10 o'clock in the morning, so if you have time. Yes, and this is our case law page. Here you can find uh, all the information on most of our activities relating to case law. So, yeah, that's. Ah, me too. <laughs> Paldies, Šana uh, Hökundze. Uh, varbūt ir jautājumi pašlaik uzreiz. Do we have some questions, maybe? Maybe later. Ja, yeah. varbūt vēlāk. I can answer later. Ja, so. yeah. um, we have a question. Yeah. Mm. If no one else is going to ask one. Um, thank you very much for the superb presentation. 
there are many questions I could ask you, but mm. uh, um, I'll pick one. <clears throat> Why do you suppose the Court of Justice decided in Levela, the cheese case, that not that the cheese was not, the taste of the cheese was not protected by copyright, but rather that the copyright directive precluded the protection of the cheese by copyright? That is to say, mm. if you have a directive, your obligation as a member state is to mm. implement it. Yeah. There's nothing in the copyright directive which says that cheese can't be protected by copyright. You just don't have to protect it, it seems, by copyright. So can you speculate as to why the court would decide not merely that the cheese was not protected, but that it couldn't be protected by copyright? I'm actually not sure it's that um, firm, no, because the court, when it says, for example, that in the current state of scientific development, it would not be possible to to clearly, objectively identify and distinguish the taste of the copyright and the taste of a food product from another one. So uh, this might also leave the door open for for future. I mean, the, the courts always give some more abstract criteria, I would say. And here, in this case, it really develops on the question of identification. So how the subject matter can be identified. So I wouldn't say it's necessarily restricted, in this case, to the taste of a cheese. Or it's about identifying to make sure the subject matter is clear for all parties. Mm. <laughs> Okay, one more. Thank you. I don't think it's, it's a question of, of um, uh, distinguishing um, the impossibility of, of distinguishing taste. Mm -hmm. the, the, there's a contrast here mm -hmm. between taste and color. In mm -hmm. color, um, there have been many attempts to produce atlases of color. Mm -hmm. There are three or four uh, well-known atlases of color where every imaginable shade mm -hmm. has been coded. You can get a, there are books, you can get books of them. Mm -hmm. You get books of color chips where every single shade is given a <coughs> thing. There's a thing called a Mansell diagram, which is F365. There's Pantone um, and quite a few other ones. And that, and in that case, you can precisely give every shade of color. But you can't really describe that one sort of peppermint is more minty than another peppermint, mm -hmm. or that Moroccan peppermint is tastier than Bulgarian peppermint. And I mean, that, that was what surely is the reason behind this judgment, because it's impossible to distinguish. And once you've got an impossibility to distinguish, then that you can't put that back into the courts mm -hmm. and get courts to give injunctions to stop people doing things because the whole point of injunctions is that people, as I shall say tomorrow, is that people must know what they can and can't do. And if you say you are forbidden to sell products containing Moroccan mint taste, mm -hmm. whatever does that mean? Nothing. And, but on the other hand, you are forbidden to use the color K375B. We all know what that means, because it's a Pantone diagram um, definition. And I think what the reason behind this ruling was that it, was, it is physically, humanly impossible to distinguish. That's really what's behind it all. And I think in, the, in that sense that Mr. Dillon, what he's saying, is he, he's, he's right. The, the decision turned on the inability properly to identify what was at stake. Yes, definitely the court says it cannot only depend on your individual perception of the subject matter. It has to be um, assessed, described with objective criteria. Paldies, nebūtu vēl kādi jautājumi.
more questions or maybe more comment? No. Pades, thank you.